Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the Haydn Symphony Crusade. And we're already up to symphony number 10. That means we only have 97 more works to go. Could you believe it? I can't imagine having a better time going through 107 different pieces of music by any one composer. Except, of course, for the Bach Cantata Schlepp, which is a whole nother project that's going to take a heck of a lot longer. Anyway, what is it about Symphony Number no. 10 that makes it special? Well, you may have noticed that in my other talks, if you've heard some of them, I've spent quite a bit of time talking about the form of individual movements and Haydn's use of form. I want to do, I want to do something a little different in this particular talk. I want to simply address one overriding theme in terms of this symphony's large-scale organic cohesion. Because as I mentioned, Haydn always conceived of his works as wholes. That is, even if they have separate movements or different parts, there's something that unites them. There's something that, that indicates that they belong together as a group. And in that respect, in that respect, Haydn was absolutely unique, unique in the classical period, unique even for composers that came later. For the next hundred years, Haydn was unique. I mean, Haydn was so extraordinary in this particular aspect of his work that, to be honest, it hasn't been recognized at all because people just didn't believe that that could be true of works from this period. But it is, and it's true of these symphonies, and it's true of these early Haydn symphonies because Haydn, there are no early Haydn symphonies. Haydn, as I said, was nearly 30 when he began writing symphonies. He was a fully mature composer. It was the musical style which was early, and that couldn't become mature until Haydn did it, because he was the guy who made it mature. So in these early symphonies, he's working out all of the different things that music can do, and that he's going to synthesize into what became the high classical style of composition. And this Symphony Number no. 10 does something incredibly important, and it does it as typical with Haydn in a very entertaining and enjoyable way, and in a way that's no mystery. There's no mystery to any of this stuff Haydn does. It may be very, very sophisticated, but it's extremely audible. He's not trying to do anything sneaky or to impress you with some sort of erudite or abstruse technical aspect of musical composition. This symphony does something that the classical style would really, really depend upon. And it really raises a whole a wonderful aesthetic question that I want you to think about as well as you listen to the music. And that is this. In this symphony, in listening to this symphony, and we're going to play almost the whole thing, I want you to pay attention to bass lines. What is happening below the melodic surface, what's happening in the cellos and basses and the bassoon, because this is a small symphony. It's only scored for two oboes, two horns, and strings, with a bassoon playing along the bass line. So it's a small orchestra, but this is the symphony where we first, I think, get a really strong inkling of just how important it is to keep your bass lines independently lively. Now, this is a very different question from writing what we call strict counterpoint, you know, such as a fugue where everybody plays the same tune one after the other and each voice has its own independence. That is not at all what we mean. What we mean is nothing less than a revolution in the concept of what instrumental music could do. And that means writing bass lines that are contributing to the musical discourse, not just because they support the tune on top, but because they sometimes get the tune. They have the tune. They have their own tune. They may have their own independent characterization. They color the tunes in their own special way. Haydn is beginning to understand and to exploit the potential of each section and each component and each pitch range of the orchestra to add something 
absolutely personal and unique to the overall symphonic discourse. And this is a critical, critical component in our idea of what the symphony can be and what the classical orchestra and later the romantic orchestra and all the orchestras after that could do. Because before that, in the Baroque period, remember, the Baroque period, the orchestra consisted of a melody on top and everything else <laughs> packed into the accompanying harmonies, all linked together by a continuo. The continuo consisted of the bass line with a keyboard instrument, such as a harpsichord or, you know, a lute or a guitar or all of them put together, an organ, something to fill in the harmony that supported the melody on top. And as CPE Bach once memorably pointed out, melody was nothing more than the surface expression of the underlying scheme of harmony that everybody else was busy realizing. In the classical period, that is no longer true. It is not. What has happened is that the orchestra has become an independent organism in which every single unit and participant can play the tune or play the accompaniment or they can play simultaneous tunes, they have to be able to do both. And in doing both, the continuo becomes completely unnecessary. That idea of having a separate unit that was responsible for the harmony that supports the voices on top, because the voices on top are no longer always the voices on top. They could be on the bottom. You can move the accompaniment all over the place. Sometimes the guys who have the tune start doing the accompaniment and vice versa. That is the great discovery of classical orchestration. And Haydn was one of the guys, perhaps the most important guy, to begin to exploit that potential. And that's why the question of harpsichord continuo parts in these early symphonies is so controversial. It's controversial because Haydn never wrote anything like that. He didn't write a keyboard part. He did not say that he needed one. There is no evidence that Haydn actually played the keyboard with these symphonies. He probably played the violin. Uh, at least in, for example, the Farewell Symphony, we know he played the violin along with his concert master. And if there was a keyboard which was used for conducting, because the idea of a conductor, that is a guy who just stands in front of everybody and doesn't play an instrument, that didn't exist in Haydn's day, unless you were leading very, very large forces like an oratorio or a, or a, you know, an opera or something like that, where you needed someone to keep everything together. But for just an orchestra purpose with, you know, just instrumental music, that idea didn't really exist. And so there would have been a keyboard instrument there. And who knows, given the fact that they practically never rehearsed <laughs> when performing these works, at least in public, there might be one rehearsal, maybe two. It was all done on the fly. The keyboard player may have been necessary to keep everybody together, to fill in the parts where everybody got lost, to mark the rhythm somehow. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why you might have a keyboard, but a formal continuo part in the Baroque style, such as we hear and will hear in these performances of Haydn's early symphonies, I don't think it's necessary. Some of the latest Haydn scholarships suggest that it's not necessary. But more importantly than that, the music suggests that it's not necessary. Why? Because if your bass line has an independent melodic existence, and if the orchestra is actively providing its own accompaniment, which is relatively full harmonically, I'm not saying there are moments where Haydn's music does not suggest it might use a little a harmonic filling out here and there. The transformation isn't always complete, but most of the time it really is. And you will hear it in this symphony. You will hear it especially in this symphony. It's really, it's really quite extraordinary. And so I want you to forget about sonata form and all the other stuff we talk about when thinking of the individual movements and think entirely when listening about the bass line. Listen below the surface. Listen to what's happening. And this symphony is particularly, particularly suitable to that kind of listening. Why? Because first of all, Haydn often gives the tune the melody to the lower part of the orchestra, number one. And number two, he, he invents a type of melody 
a type of, of thematic substance that's very, very well suited to that kind of listening. In other words, quite often the texture in the symphony will consist of just two different types of, of melodic motion. One is a melody in long, slow notes, and the second is a quicker melody, either below or above, in fast notes. And so you can hear these two types of music and texture interchanging, going from top to bottom and back again. And that gives the entire symphony the, the feeling of being written for the full orchestra, for its full range, its full range of, of pitches all the way through from top to bottom. And as a result, even though this is a small symphony only written for, like I said, two oboes, two horns and strings, it has a richer, richer, denser sound than a lot of the early, other early symphonies because Haydn is expanding the, the use to which the orchestra is put. It's not always just, oh, well, the violins get the tune and maybe the oboe or the horn get a bit of the tune and everybody else is just chugging along on the bottom. No, no, no. Here, everybody has an opportunity to participate with, the, with, with an enrichment of the texture generally. And so, without further ado, I want you to hear the entire first movement without repeats, and I want you to pay particular attention to what's happening down below. And I'm going to, I'll indicate in a couple spots, not always, but in a couple particular spots where you can hear that the melody is going into the bass line and you can hear how it moves about. And it's just wonderful. It's very, very delightfully entertaining to follow, to follow the, the treasure hunt of the tune or whether it may be two simultaneously. And you'll hear these contrasting textures and you'll see how it just seems to energize the, the, entire the entire orchestral fabric it's marvelous so here as usual we have patrick gawa with symphonia finlandia here is the first movement of symphony number no. 10 <laughs> you got a sense of the idea of baseline, melody, and 
their, their invertibility. It's particularly clear there in a few spots, not always, but in a few spots, enough to create a, a welcome contrast and enrichment of the music's texture. The slow movement does this even more graphically. I really, really graphically. In fact, I'm only going to play you the recapitulation, the closing section of the slow movement. But that raises a very interesting question because you have a continuo part here, a harpsichord part, which somebody must have written out. It certainly wasn't improvised um, on the spot. And you have to ask yourself what it's there for. <laughs> I mean, why is it there? This question is going to come up even more graphically in the finale. But I want you to listen to this. It is so transparently clear what Haydn is doing. Why? Because all of the melodic substance at the beginning of this movement is in the violas, the cellos, and the basses. And the violins, for the opening theme, they just have one note. And it's a high note, and they're just up there holding this one note, going like that, right? And everybody else is playing the tune underneath. So you know exactly what Haydn is doing. And he makes something so exquisitely poetic about it. And then that high single note becomes its own melody, which the violins take on. And after that, you have the violins as, as one melodic component and all of the lower strings as the other melodic component. And it's just marvelous, marvelous and lovely. And what the hell is the harpsichord doing there? It's totally unnecessary. And not only is it unnecessary, but in a sense, because it always is doing the same thing, that is reinforcing the bass line, it tends to get in the way of what of what Haydn's really doing, which is proving their interchangeability. Because as soon as we understand that they're interchangeable, the continuo part becomes unnecessary. Completely irrelevant. But people do it anyway. I don't know. We'll see more in a moment. But listen now to the end of the slow move and listen to just how the first violins sit on that note on top, everyone else gets the tune below them, and then they begin to exchange places until the end of the movement. And again, every so often I'll maybe point out a little bassy bit that you can listen to. Here you go. You're getting the point, right? I mean, it's like I said, it's not its not a mystery, but we have to tell ourselves, you know, because we're so used to Haydn's, Haydn's practice being the standard way orchestras operate. We're so used to it. We, we don't think about just how fresh and new um, this must have sounded back in the day, but we can easily put ourselves in a position where it sounds fresh and new to us because Haydn's inspiration for it draws our attention to what he's doing. And that makes it sound special. The finale now, come to the finale. The finale is one of those rollicking sort of sea chanty, you know, happy, happy, energetic movements. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. One of the things that sort of characterizes the best composers of this period is their energy. We always talk about Beethoven, you know, Beethoven had this unbelievable volcanic energy, this rawness that a lot of people that they thought was extremely crude 
They thought that he was just vulgar and noisy. They thought that about Haydn, too. Haydn was considered a noisy composer in his day, a loud composer. And the reason, of course, is because he used the full orchestra, as he does in this symphony. He uses it all the time. He does not just write a tune on top with everybody else discreetly accompanying below. He energizes the whole orchestral fabric. Everybody has something to do. It's not cluttered. It's not clogged but it's exciting and it gives his music this boundless energy and feeling of, of irresistible, irresistible movement that some listeners of the day, especially those more accustomed to the traditional baroque kind of expression, it gave them a sense of exhaustion and, and it irritated them, it really did. And Haydn had that reputation for being sort of loud and obstreperous as a composer, precisely the qualities we love so much now. But once again, in this movement, which I'll play all the way through without repeats, uh, you will hear, and it's only about a minute and a half long that way without repeats, um, you will hear those wonderful moments where the bass line takes over and we're conscious of the fact that there's a whole component of the orchestra that Haydn's discovering. And he doesn't just discover it you know, for the sake of having it play the same thing the guys on top are doing. He discovers it to give it its own character, its own special expressive quality. And that is just as important as the fact that he's using it in the first place. There is a passage in the development section, which I will point out, and the little, you know, superscriptions as it plays, that is so marvelous. It's soft, but an entire new world of expression opens up as Haydn starts to exploit the special character of the orchestra's lower end. And he doesn't, you know, these are, again, small forms, tiny, tiny scale, short movements. The whole symphony plays for 13 minutes. This movement only plays for three and a half with repeats. But it, it doesn't matter because even on that small scale, when he does something extraordinary, it's all the more graphic because it's, it's all the more distinctive and unusual. And your ear has not become saturated or sated with the usual things up to that point. And you'll hear it, you'll hear it so vividly. It's, it's, it's an amazing moment. And I just want you to think for a minute about what this means. And also, by the way, you will hear that harpsichord tinkling away behind this moment. And if you're like me, you will be wondering, what the hell is it doing there? It doesn't contribute anything useful. Not a thing, an occasional twink, an occasional plonk. It should just stop. Even if it's being played in loud passages to support the sound or the rhythm or do something, okay, fine. But in this passage, what for? What on earth is it doing? And you also have to ask yourself, these are like professional musicians, very good musicians, very talented, but are they thinking? I mean, do they have brains? Are they doing it just because someone said, oh, that's the way it was done back then? Or are they doing it because there's some cognizable musical necessity? I mean, I often wonder whether or not musicians think for themselves, especially the period instrument people who are like little witless lemmings doing whatever they're told to do, you know? I mean, they like to tell us that everything that they're doing is based on the most recent and deepest and best scholarship. But the fact is that scholarship does not give you the excuse to behave like a witless lemming when your plain musical intelligence and the evidence of the printed page says that that scholarship is absolutely completely wrong about what's going on musically. Anyway, that's me, and that was my rant for the day. Let's listen to the finale, and particularly to that wonderful moment in the development section when the low end of the orchestra takes over the discourse and changes the entire expressive impact of the movement. Here it is. Thank you. 
Extraordinary, isn't it? Beautiful, lovely, fresh, lively, but with those those hints of something deeper. And that something deeper is going to become increasingly exploited as the classical era and Haydn's participation in it continues, and he's going to find marvelous things to do with with these new sounds and new regions that he's exploring. And I'll tell you right now, if you want to skip ahead a little bit, listen to Symphony 103, the drum roll symphony, which is probably the most potent explanation among Haydn's symphonies of what you can do with a bass line in the first movement of that symphony. It's just amazing what's going to happen, but we should be aware of it now because even in symphony number 10, these, these early works, Haydn is showing us what the orchestra can do, and he's trying out every conceivable different strategy to create works that show a unity among their parts that does not depend on direct thematic recall. The unity is a question of style, of aesthetics, of technique, of treatment of the themes, it, 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 it exists on many, many different levels. And that's why all the movements of Symphony Number no. 10 could only belong to Symphony Number no. 10. So thank you for joining me on this Haydn Symphony Crusade. Keep on listening, folks. We're just getting started. Take care. <laughs>